Hello everyone and welcome to the GenQA Focus On webinar on meiotic chromosomal segregation today. Um, we have a great pleasure in welcoming you to this webinar and really it's come about because of a recurring theme where we've seen across a lot of our cytogenetics and cytogenomics EQAs um, an issue where laboratories are, are misinterpreting um, chromosomal segregation and we thought it was a, a, a valuable educational um, opportunity for the GenQA team to present um, a webinar, an educational webinar on this theme. So I have great pleasure in handing over now to my colleague, um, Mark Seals, who's the Deputy Director um, in GenQA that covers um, many of the cytogenomics EQAs that are delivered to you. So Mark, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, we will have a live Q&A session after Mark's presentation. So I would um, ask you to add your questions into the questions box and, and we'll hopefully address them as, as much as we can at the end of the session. So Mark, over to you now, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest GenQA Focus On. So my name is Mark Sales and I'm one of the scientists working in cytogenomics for GenQA. And today I'm going to speak about meiosis and meiotic segregation. As Sandy said, it's clear from some of our EQAs that the understanding the process of meiotic segregation can be challenging, especially with the increased use of arrays and NGS for cytogenomic analysis. Hopefully this talk will help a little bit with that understanding. So a brief overview. So it, it, my talk is briefly going to cover the process of meiosis and then go into more detail about some of the segregation patterns that might be seen depending on the type of rearrangement that's carried by one of the parents. Um, the main focus will be on balanced reciprocal translocations because they're the most common, uh, but we will touch on some of the other abnormalities as well. So as you know, meiosis, uh, so first of all, I'm going to cover meiosis. So as you know, humans are a diploid organism with our cells carrying two copies of each of the chromosomes. And meiosis is the process required to produce eggs or sperm because these are haploid cells carrying only one copy of each chromosome. The diploid complement is then reinstated when the egg is fertilized by a sperm. So meiosis consists of two cell divisions. Uh, the first is meiosis one, which is kind of a reduction division uh, to get the cells to be haploid and meiosis 2 where the sister chromatids are separated and the end result is four haploid cells. So this is shown diagrammatically in this picture here. So here we're just going to follow the journey of just one chromosome as it goes through meiosis. So for example chromosome 1. Before meiosis starts there are an homologous pair of chromosome 1s in a diploid cell. During interphase and at the start of the first meiotic division, the homologous chromosome ones replicate to produce chromatids, and these pair up so that they're aligned together, the homologous pairs line up. At this point, the cells can be thought of as having four copies of chromosome one material. During meiosis one, the pair of chromosome ones are separated into separate cells, which is shown in the diagram here. Uh, this is effectively the reduction division from diploid to haploid, in which the homologous chromosomes are separated. Um, so effectively, in each of these cells at this point, you have enough material for two chromosome ones. During meiosis two, the individual chromatids are separated into individual cells. So now the chromatids, sorry, now the cells contain one chromatid, so effectively one copy of the chromosome one material, and these cells are now haploid. So the first abnormality I'm going to cover is balanced reciprocal translocations. So what happens during meiosis if one of the parents carries a balanced reciprocal translocation? So first of all, what is a balanced reciprocal translocation? So most of you will know that this is a swap of material between two chromosomes, and usually there's no gain or loss of material. So in the picture shown here, you can see there's a swap of material between chromosomes four and 20. If the translocation is balanced, then the carrier of the rearrangement will have no net loss of chromosome material and is unlikely to be any phenoty phenotypic effect in the carrier, unless by bad luck a gene is interrupted by the translocation, but that's pretty rare for that to happen. Around about one in 500 people carry balanced translocations, so it's not that rare, 
Uh, and to put this in context, the population of the UK is around about 67 million. So there will be about 134,000 carriers of reciprocal translocations in the UK. So, as I mentioned earlier, during meiosis one, the homologous chromosomes pair up. However, if there's a rearrangement, then it gets a bit more complicated. To allow all the chromosomes involved to pair when there is a balanced reciprocal translocation, a quadrivalent may form. This allows the homologous segments to pair with one another. The shape of the quadrivalent and whether it will form properly will depend on the size of the translocated segments, and I'll discuss this in a bit more detail later on. This structure is visualized mi microscopically during the packeting stage of meiosis when the chromosomes start to shorten and thicken, and therefore sometimes it's referred to as a packeting cross. It should be noted, that I'm not shown in the diagram, that at this stage each chromosome is actually still made up of two chromatids. So at meiosis one, there are several different possible gametes that can be formed depending on the mode of chromosomal segregation. And this mode of segregation is influenced by the size of the translocated segments. And there are 16 possible gametes that can produce, be produced at this stage. So the different forms of segregation are things like alternate, uh, which is where sort of opposite based chromosomes in the uh, quadrivalent um, segregate together. Uh, this is the only mode that leads to gametes with a complete uh, genetic complement and it would produce either normal or balanced gametes. And as you can see, uh, the gametes produced from this would either be chromosome four and 20, which are both normal, or the derivative 4 and the derivative 20, which will be then balanced. Second form of segregation, uh, which again is a, a 2 to 2 segregation, is adjacent 1. And this is where adjacent chromosomes with non-homologous centromeres travel together. And this is the most frequently seen mode of mal segregation. So you get the 4 and the drive 20, or the drive 4 and the 20 moving together. So at the end of this, there would be a net, a net imbalance of material, either, uh, well, probably a loss and a gain, depending on which chromosomes have moved. The second form of adjacent segregation is where the homologous centromeres travel together. So both chromosome 4 centromeres or both chromosome 20 seg uh, centromeres segregate together. Um, here there is a greater imbalance, um, and generally these are not uh, viable. Um, rarely they can be, but usually they're not viable. There are four forms of three to one segregation. So uh, three of the chromosomes travel together and one's left on its own. So this would produce gametes with either 24 or 22 chromosomes. So you can have tertiary trisomy, where two normal chromosomes and one of the translocated chromosomes move together tertiary monosomy, which is uh, where one of the normal chromosomes moves on its own, interchange trisomy, where the two translocation chromosomes and one of the normal chromosomes move together, or interchange monosomy, when it's one of the translocated chromosomes that's on its own. So there are four, as I say, there are four possible combinations possible from that. So in our example, um, the complement of the gametes, so sort of the tertiary, the trisomy would be uh, the 4, the DIR4, and the 20, and the monosomy would be the DIR20. Um, and as you say, you can see from that, the interchange, it's, it's the other chromosomes. Tertiary trisomy is the most common of these. Uh, interchange trisomy is, is rarer than the tertiary trisomy. Tertiary monosomy is extremely rare, and interchange monosomy has only ever been seen at PGT. So the majority of times these will not actually be seen in the lab, but depending on the shape of the packeting cross, they may well be. A very rare form of segregation is four to zero segregation, where all the chromosomes go to one cell and, and none of them go to the other cell, which will produce gametes with 25 or 21 chromosomes. And this is mainly of academic interest but again, might have some uh, relevance in PGT where it might be seen, but generally these won't be seen in, in live births. As I say, the shape of the packeting cross or the quadrivalent will influence the type of segregation that happens. So if the translocated segments are small, then adjacent one is most likely. If the centric segments are small, then adjacent two is most likely. 
Um, if it's the quadrivalent is very lopsided, then you get mainly three to one segregations, and it might not form a proper quadrivalent. It might form a chain. And if both segments are large, the chances of getting an unbalanced segregant that's viable is, is fairly small. So it's important to have a look at the shape of the, the quadrivalent um, and how that might influence what products you're actually expecting to see. Um, this is especially important sort of during PGT. So further recombination can occur during meiosis too. And if recombination occurs in the interstitial, interstitial segment between the centromere and the breakpoint at meiosis one, followed by segregation at meiosis two, it can produce further unbalanced combinations. Most of these will not be viable, but may be detected during PGT. Um, and these are better outlined in Scriven et al. Um, from 1998. So the second form of abnormality I'm going to discuss is Robertsonian translocations. So a Robertsonian translocation occurs between acrocentric chromosomes and it results in the losses of the short arms. The short arms are not that important because they only really ca uh, carry ribosomal RNA genes and as long as you have some ribosomal RNA genes, then you tend to be okay. So you don't need all the acrocentrics to carry them. Again, usually there's no phenotypic effect for the carrier. And these rearrangements wouldn't be detected by array or NGS because it's affecting repetitive sequences. So they wouldn't be detected by array. Again, during meiosis, the homologous pairs will, homologous chromosomes will pair up. But this time, rather than forming a quadrivalent, they'll form a trivalent, where the three chromosomes um, produce like a, a Y sort of shape. And this allows the matching segments on the chromosomes to pair up. So this diagram shows the chromosomal complement of the gametes. So I'm not going to go through them all. Um, but really the only one that's likely to be viable from this translocation is the trisomy 21. What's interesting is depending on the chromosomes involved, um, if trisomic or monosomic rescue occurs, then there is also the option of UPD. So chromosome 14 and 15, if they're involved and you get um, rescue of a trisomy or of one of the monosomies, then you might have UPD 14 or 15, which will have a, a phenotype. Some of the other UPD ones, or some of the other ones where you get rescue may not have a phenotype, so you wouldn't even be aware of it. So the third form of abnormality I'm going to touch on is inversions. So an inversion is a rearrangement within a chromosome. Two breaks occur and a segment of the chromosome is rotated by 180 degrees. If this is balanced, there's likely to be no phenotypic effect on the carrier. And there are two types, paracentric, where the centromere is not involved in the inverted segment, and pericentric, where the centromere is part of the inverted segment. So we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. So paracentric inversions. Um, at meiosis, an inverted chromosome will form an inversion loop to allow the homologous chromosomes to pair. If crossing over occurs within the loop, then that will result in recombinant products. In a paracentric inversion, this will form a dicentric and an acentric fragment. And each of these is unlikely to form a viable product. There are occasions with, with paracentric inversions that viable products can be formed if you get U loops um, and recombination occurring, but it's, it's fairly rare that these are seen. So pericentric inversions, again, an inversion loop is formed. And again, if crossing over occurs and you get recombinant products. Here, the products could potentially be viable depending on the size and the amount of imbalance. And here you'll get um, duplications and deletions occurring depending on where the crossover occurs. So the larger the inversion, there is a greater chance of the crossover occurring and less of an imbalance being caused. So this will then increase the, the chance of, un, of unbalanced viable products. So if you find a really big uh, inversion, then the risk is much higher than if you find a small pericentric inversion. 
Okay, so the next type of abnormality is an insertion. And insertions are interesting because they can be either direct or inverted. They can be within a chromosome, i.e. intrachromosome, intrachromosomal, or they can be between chromosomes, interchromosomal. Again, carriers of the insertion are balanced or usually balanced, but unbalanced products can be produced during meiosis. And like in the other abnormalities or other rearrangements, um, carriers tend not to be have a phenotype associated with it. So what do we mean by direct or inverted? So direct or inverted is dependent on relationship to the centromere. So if an insertion is within the same arm of a chromosome, then the orientation towards the centromere needs to be maintained. If it moves between arms, then it needs to be switched around. And I'll show a bit more of an example of this later on. So in the diagram shown here, you can see the direct insertion where the star and the two stars indicate either end of the inserted segment. So for the direct insertion, if it's moved into another chromosome, the star and the two stars stay in the same orientation as the centromere. And that's a direct insertion. If they're flipped around so the two stars are near the centromere um, rather than the one star, then that's an inverted insertion. So as I say, the, the, the direct or inverted is in relation to the, the centromere rather than uh, the insertion itself. Right, so the insertions can be either inter or intra-chromosomal. So an inter-chromosomal insertion is where it's between chromosomes. So here we can see an area of chromosome 4 here being moved into chromosome 20. And if the banding stays the same and it's within the same arm, so both of these are in the Q arm, this is a direct insertion into chromosome 20. So again, when you get an insertion, what will tend to happen is you'll get a loop forming to allow the chromosomes to um, pair up properly. And gamete, uh, gamete production is follow, following the formation of quadrivalent in the in interchromosomal insertion with a single crossover having occurred in the insertion loop. Only one uh, chromatid in, is shown in the diagram. Um, and you'll get various recombinants depending on where the crossover occurs and the size of the uh, the insertions and, sorry, the size of the duplications and deletions occurring with that. So here we have a, a sort of a, a real life example, if you like. So this is an insertion between uh, chromosome one and chromosome five. So there's a chunk of chromosome five inserted into chromosome one. And in the lower part of the diagram, we have a recombinant. So we have a recombinant one or a recombinant five, well, recombinant one and recombinant five. So the child represents the BD combination, the previous slides. So the child is actually trisomic for the segment 5Q11 to Q22. As you can see, insertions are quite difficult in terms of segregation patterns. So this is something that's probably worth spending a bit of time looking at, something like Gardner and Sutherland, just to go through it in more detail. So the second type of insertion is an intrachromosomal insertion in, in the intrachrom is an intrachromosomal insertion, sorry. So this is where the, the movement of the material is within the same chromosome. Now this can be within the same arm or it can be between arms. And as I say, a direct insertion will maintain the orientation of the segment with regard to the centromere. So in the second half of this diagram, if you look at the red and the green spots. As the segment has moved from the Q arm to the P arm, then it, it needs to flip over to maintain the orientation. So the red spots and the green spots maintain the orientation to the centromere. So this is a direct insertion, even though you might think it's inverted because it's moved, it's, it's flipped over relative to the chromosome. It needs to maintain the orientation to the centromere. The, in the left part of the diagram shows a within arm insertion with the uh, inserted segments cross hatched and the right hand side shows a between arm. So 
so what happens when you have an insertion? So this is a between arm insertion here. And to allow pairing, what tends to happen is the, the areas that can't pair up loop out. So again, you get various different combinations occurring depending on the looping out and whether crossing over occurs. Um, and you'll get duplications and deletions from this or balanced insertions. If the centric segment is, is quite long, there's a proportion of the whole chromosome, it provides quite a, a lot of opportunity for crossover. So in that case, the genetic risk is expected to be high and could in theory approach 50%. So in other words, with a long centric segment, the segregation ratio for the four possible segregant outcomes of normal balanced or insertion, duplication and deletion will be close to one to one to one to one. So same arm, uh, incomplete synapsis. So as both segments shift in an in-arm insertion, essentially switching positions, each could be called the inserted segment. If both segments maintain the same orientation towards the centromere, it's a direct insertion. If the orientation of one segment is reversed, it's an inverted insertion. In the case of the inverted insertion, we can distinguish one segment from the other by referring to respective inverted and non-inverted segments. In the direct insertion, the shorter of the two segments can be arbitrarily labeled as the inserted segment and the longer as the non-inserted segment or the interstitial segment. However, since they are both really insertion segments, we can also speak of the shorter inserted and the longer inserted segments. The within arm shift in, in the case of the direct insertion can have a similar folding out of one inserted segment and its homo homolog on the normal chromosome to enable synapses of the other inserted segment and its homologous region. And that'll probably depend on the size. So it's probably gonna be the shorter segment that folds out the majority of the time. I'm not gonna go into too much detail of this because it does get quite complicated. Um, various different loop formations occur um, and I would recommend looking at Gardner and Sutherland for more information on this because trying to describe it is, is quite difficult. But it is included in the talk which will be on YouTube at some point. So, we have seen in quite a number of our EQAs where uh, array and NGS testing is being used as a surrogate for G-banding, then it's, it's difficult sometimes to tell what's going on with segregation. So if you see a gain or a loss or a combination of gain and loss, then it, consider the possibility that there is a chromosomal rearrangement present. In these cases, conventional cytogenetic or FISH follow-up in a parent would be required to check for balance rearrangement. You can't follow it up with array or NGS because you're not going to pick up all the balance rearrangements if you do it that way. So we would recommend cytogenetic or fish follow-up in these cases. So in summary, it can be as it can be seen, myotic segregation is complex. Um, not so much for the balanced reciprocal translocations, but certainly for some of the other rearrangements, it gets very complex. It is important to establish whether a parent carries a rearrangement, the type of the rearrangement and how it may segregate. And care must be taken to correctly interpret the results found by array or NGS in the context of any known parental rearrangements. So when you're doing array or NGS, make sure that you can work out which of the products is being produced and what the implications of that is. That's the end of my talk, um, and I'm now happy to take any questions and answers. Thank you, Mark, very much indeed. That was a, a lot of information to take on there, but a very um, useful presentation to, to cover all elements. We've got a couple of questions coming in, but I do encourage our audience to submit questions in the question box, and we'll try and get to them. Um, First one is you mentioned about Gardner and Sutherland being a really good resource um, for information, a go-to place. Is there anything else that we can use, we can go to, or is that the best, the blessed um, source of information? 
I think Gardner and Sutherland is probably the best in terms of the way it summarises everything and it is very comprehensive. Um, there is some information in the ISCN and obviously any publications such as Scriven and some of the other publications that are out there are quite useful as well. Absolutely. And I guess it also uh, one thing that we should say is when you're interpreting results from your test, you should always look up the, the recent publications because things do change, don't they? And you always want to have that most up to date information um, to use when interpreting your results. Yep, that's correct. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And I guess also this is going to be a really good resource as well, your summary. It's very nice to have it in one place. And as you say, it will be available on the GenQA YouTube channel um, shortly. So again, it's another go-to source. Um, another question here, what happens when there's a sex chromosome translocation? That's an interesting question. Um... <laughs> Some it, it, it depends it depends on the the sex chromosome that's involved and mm -hmm. sometimes or well a reasonable number of times it will actually produce infertility so in which case you're not going to see the myotic segregants anyway especially if chromosome oh. y is involved um if the x is involved then it can uh, the, the the carrier can be fertile um and again Sometimes the effects in the the fetus or the child can be mitigated by X inactivation. So there are a number of different things that can happen with sex chromosomes. Um, again, they're outlined in quite a lot of detail in Gardner and Sutherland. So um, depending on what the abnormality is, that's probably quite a good resource to to have a look and see what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's very much something that you have to take on a case by case basis. Case by case basis, yeah. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, we have another one here. When should I use? Oh, this is an ISCN question, so sorry about this. When should I use DER and REC in ISCN? Okay, so usually a derived chromosome would be referring to one of the products of the translocation. So if you have a balanced translocation and you inherit one of those products directly, then that is a DER chromosome from that translocation. Um, recombinant chromosomes are used for ones that are maybe the insertions where you have a recombination event. It's not a, just a straight uh, inheritance of one of the uh, parental chromosomes, there's actually a recombination has occurred. Um, and that's I think, outlined in the ISCN quite clearly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's quite a concise um, answer. That's really helpful. So, and I guess we always recommend the use of the most current version of the ICN, and the current one is um, from the, the chair. ICN 2020. Um, yeah, and our own Ros Hastings, who's part of the GenQA team, is part of that um, that paper. Great. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we have just now. Um, Mark, thank you very much indeed for giving a very comprehensive um, educational session. We appreciate it. And thank you for everyone who submitted their questions there. Um, we have a slide on feedback. Oh, we have one final question. And because it's on NGS, then I have to ask it because that is one of my areas. Um, what NGS would be most suitable? And I'm just looking right. So that's the end of it. Is PGTA fish being discontinued today? So I guess this is more of a general Gen QA question. But then as you run those EQAs, then that's that's useful. Um, and as the post-psychotic mosaicism, would NGS be the most suitable? So two questions there, really. So first of all, okay. PGTA fish, is that being discontinued? So I presume the EQA for that. No, the PGT fish will be continued. That's still an ongoing EQA. Um, it's mainly looking at very small terminal segments that probably wouldn't be detected by Array and NGS. So that is still uh, ongoing. Uh, PGT blastomere fish, which I think is distributed in May or June. And registration is still open for that as well. So please, yep. um, Olivia, log on. And then the second question, as for postzygotic mosaicism, would NGS be the most suitable, I presume the most suitable method to pick mosaicism up? That one I'm not sure I can answer, to be honest, Sandy. <laughs> I'm not really sure what they're actually asking. 
Yeah, so I would say, could you maybe just um, pop it in an email to us and we'll definitely get back to you. I think we yeah. need to more background information that would be helpful. Thank you for that. Lovely. Okay, well, thank you very much. Do we have our okay. next slide on feedback? Uh, yeah, hold on one second. Well, so um, as with all our focus on um, webinars, we, we like to keep up to date with everyone. So we would say if you're not already linked up to all of our social media um, or get receive um, emails, then do get in touch with us and we'll, we will set you up on some of our emails as well. Um, if not, then please keep going to our website. We've got everything advertised there and also on our other social media sites. And then we do, you will um, receive a participant certificate after this um, webinar closes. So please do um, also include um, feedback to us. We run these focus on webinars very much on topics that our participants would like to hear about. Obviously, this one was very um, tailored and specific to an item um, and an issue that is um, raised across a lot of our EQAs. But we do many, many different um, types of themed webinars so please let us know what you think and what you'd like us to do in the future and um, this webinar will be available to yourselves through a private link for a short period of time and then it will be available on the GenQA YouTube channel so please do um, ask your colleagues to to review and, and join us on the YouTube channel if that's of interest to them so the March 22 focus on webinar topic is again slightly different this time it's on quality management and its impact on real life so we we hope that you can join us then. Thank you again. Thank you to the team who's arranged the webinar within GenQA and a big thank you to Mark as well for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you.